All right, so I'm going to take you guys back 25 years to start off. I'm going to take you back to 1984. In 1984, Neil Postman, a New Yorker, was sitting in New York thinking about the book 1984. And he started to think that the Orwellian vision had not come true in the United States. But the Huxleyan version maybe had. The Orwellian version was this vision in which, you know, the big brother state control had basically taken, taken over everything. The Huxleyan version was one in which we had basically amused ourselves to death. Um, in the Orwellian version, uh, Orwell feared that, uh, the, feared those people who had banned books. Huxley feared that there would be no reason to ban books because nobody would want to read them. Uh, Orwell was concerned that the truth would be concealed. Huxley was concerned that the truth would be drowned in irrelevance. And uh, Orwell was concerned about a captive culture, whereas Huxley was concerned about a trivial culture. And when uh, Postman looked around at the beginning of the 1980s and saw the cable revolution emerging all around him, he declared that we were indeed amusing ourselves to death, that the Huxleyan vision was coming to fruition. And uh, Postman's uh, whole perspective is the one that sort of energizes me. And it's this idea of media ecology. And it's this pretty simple idea with really powerful consequences. It's this idea that media are environments, that media are not just tools, that media are not just means of communication, that media mediate our conversations. And when media change, our conversations change. And because our conversations dictate who can say what, when, where, how, what can be said, and so on, that means we're looking at broad cultural changes. Or as his buddy Marshall McLuhan used to say, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And so here's your 60 second version of Amusing Ourselves to Death. For those who haven't read it, uh, it's mostly about the impact of television. The, the core idea is that the conversations of our culture happen on television, or they used to at least, that the conversations are controlled by the few, designed for the masses, they're always entertaining, even the serious ones. They're punctuated by 30 second commercials, and all of these conversations collectively create our culture. And he defined this culture as one of irrelevance, incoherence, and impotence. And he, to drive home this idea of impotence, he asked his audience in 1984, he said, what steps do you plan to take to reduce the conflict in the Middle East? I mean, this stuff is just all over the news. So what steps do you plan to take to reduce the conflict? Or the rates of inflation, crime, or unemployment? What do you plan to do about NATO, OPEC, the CIA, etc.? And then he takes the liberty of answering for you. He says, you plan to do nothing. And this is about where we were in 1984. He said that the public has adjusted it to incoherence and been amused into indifference. And so now we turn to 25 years later. So here we are in 2009. This is my classroom. I face classes like this every semester. I usually have 200 to 400 students in the middle of Kansas. And so I have this front row seat to see you know, where culture is going with this new generation. And we all are hopeful that this new media scape that has emerged will make a really big difference, that it will change the situation we see here. But I will tell you from the front lines, you can talk to faculty member after faculty member, there's a lot of discouragement on the front lines. We, we don't see as much engagement as the hype might lead you to say. See, and now all you have to do is look at this classroom. The classrooms are disengaged. There's not as much political engagement as you might like to see, and so on. And so as I was looking at this, I was reminded also of this. And I don't know if you guys have see the difference here. <laughs> but um, it's, it's clearly not about them, right? It's, there's something in the, the atmosphere, something in the context, something in the structure that we, we're creating for them. And uh, so in studying this, I actually you know, got all my students together to study themselves. And, and one of the great quotes that emerged from this, we were trying to figure out this American Idol phenomenon, and we found this great quote that we thought explained this. It says, what we are encountering is a panicky and almost hysterical attempt to escape from the deadly anonymity of modern life. And the prime cause is not vanity, but the craving of people who feel their personality sinking lower and lower into the whirl of indistinguishable atoms to be lost in a mass civilization. They really seem to capture, you know, the reason behind American Idol. But in fact, this is Henry Canby from 1926. And Henry Canby was actually talking about the anonymity you feel in the city, the sort of lonely one in a million type feeling that you might feel in the city. Um, you know, sociologists have been looking at this sort of sense of anomie and insignificance for quite some time. They find roots of it not only in city life, 
but also in uh, work conditions in which you're on an assembly line, totally replaceable. You have no sense of significance in that role. Uh, the movement to suburbia didn't help much because then you suddenly feel increasingly disconnected, increasingly not a part of a community. Uh, you're connected only by roads and television sets. And when the conversations of the culture are happening on television, and it's a one-way conversation, you have to be on TV to have a voice. You have to be on TV to be significant. And so maybe it's no wonder then that American Idol would have such uh, a following. Now, in the 25 years since Postman, you've had this huge boom of cable television. So in the 80s and 90s, you had this big boom, especially the MTV uh, revolution. So I was very much a part of this. This is when I was 17 years old in 1992. This is how I used to sign my name. This is, I mean, talk about narcissism, right? Like, this is my journal from 1992. I used to sign my name, Mike, as it was, you know, as if it were MTV. Um, and it's funny, you know, to think back, if we were, if we were talking about the next generation 15 years ago, we would have been labeling them TV generation. We would have said that they have short attention spans because they, you know, four minute videos, the rest, all that stuff. That they're materialistic, narcissistic, and not easily impressed. Uh, pretty similar to what we say about today's generation when we're uh, having an off day. Uh, but there's this great quote, you know, about this. This is from uh, Thomas de Zengotita. He, he looks at this mass of information coming at them, and he says, In the midst of a fabulous array of historically unprecedented and utterly mind-boggling stimuli, whatever. <laughs> so we got really excited about this quote, uh, my students and I. So we started mining Google Books and, and uh, Google Scholar for every instance of whatever that we could find. And we started to put together a brief history of whatever. And this is still in process, uh, so it's not quite as clean as I'd like it to be. But here's the basics of what we're finding so far. Basically, prior to the 1960s, whatever had three or four different meanings. One of the uh, common ones is whatever, that's what I meant. So somebody was, this, uh, you, you say something, Somebody ex says the same thing back to you, but in slightly different words, and you just say, whatever, that's what I meant. Okay, but by the late 60s, it took on, almost, it had a real cultural heft to it. Uh, you know, it almost became an icon of the culture. A and it had this sense of, like, like I don't care, like, I'm, I'm not part of the system, like, whatever. It had, you know, it's like the, um, the hippie generation, the sort of, you know, whatever, man. You know, like that sense of whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, one of the great... Uh, pieces we found is from the Department of Defense, uh, a message to POWs returning in 1973 actually took time to explain this new version of the word whatever. So there's definitely something going on there. Uh, by the 1990s, you know, the, with a blast of MTV material and MTV generation, you have a no, new word that emerges and that's the indifferent meh. Um, I'll give you a, sort of a brief history of this. Um, this is from 1992. Oh. So we have We're the MTV generation. There we go. Okay, so this is 1992, The Simpsons. Nothing you say can upset us. We're the MTV generation. We feel neither highs nor lows. Really? What's it like? Eh. <laughs> Alright, so you get the eh, right? It wasn't quite meh. But then on the message boards, Melrose Place message boards, um, soon after that, picked it up and started using meh, M-E-H. Alright, so, and here you get it. This is now 2001, The Simpsons again. You like to go to Blackoland? Meh. But the TV gave me the impression that we said meh. M E H. Meh. So this is also, uh, you know, back on 1992. This is the rock anthem of the year uh, from Nirvana. I find it hard. It's hard to find. Oh well, whatever. Never mind. Um, the same song. I feel stupid and contagious. Here we are now. Entertain us. This, uh, these lyrics are often repeated in the halls, uh, hallways, as faculty complain about this. Um, <laughs> and yet, 1992 was also the era of reality TV. Reality TV was launched basically in the U.S. in 1992 with the Real World and a number of other shows that soon followed, all the way to. American Idol. And the question that emerges in this context is basically why all these people, I don't know if you ever watched the American Idol tryouts, is why all these people, not only do they want to be stars, but why do they all think that they deserve to be stars? I mean, you've heard these people sing, right? It's a pretty shocking thing. So this became another little aspect that we were trying to explain. And there's a lot of theories out about it. One of them is that this is the generation raised by the self-help generation. So the 70s, you know, I'm okay, you're okay stuff. Those are now the parents of this next generation that become extremely self-focused, extremely confident, and so on. But uh, Thomas de Zengotiza has yet another interesting theory here. 
He suggests that all of this media is produced by the most creative people on the planet, armed with billions of dollars, and they create all of this stuff just for you, just for each and every one of us. And that's ultimately very flattering. And so he says part of the narcissism that we see in this generation comes about through that. Now, there is actually a new uh, version of whatever that's emerged in this context, and I'll play a clip here that expresses this. This is from South Park. And now back to more kids who are out of control on the Mary Poppins Show. Our next mother is Leanne Cartman. Her son claims to be the most out of control kid in the world and says there's nothing his stupid mom can do about it. Well, let's bring him out. Here's Eric Cartman. <laughs> So by the late 90s to the present, you get this whatever, I'll do what I want. It's got this real narcissistic edge to it, like I'm the most important person on the planet. The young female version is the whatever, you know, and you get this sort of narcissistic sort of side to these things. So Jean Twingy actually set out to get the stats on all this stuff, and it's a pretty thorough study that she put forth in Generation Me. You can see it's subtitled, Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident, Assertive, Entitled, and more miserable than ever before. The reason why they're miserable is because they think they're the next American Idol, and then when they're not, they're shocked. <laughs> and this narcissism is actually pretty prevalent. You see it all around us. I don't... <laughs> But there's this other side to it, and um, there's this great philosopher, Charles Taylor, who has pointed out that this, what looks like narcissism is actually a core ethic in our society, and that is the search for identity and recognition in a society that does not automatically give identity and recognition. You have to create your own. And so this is what he calls the search for the authentic self in his book, The Ethics of Authenticity. But he mentions that there are two negative slides in the midst of this, that we're sliding towards one, self-centered modes of self-fulfillment. That's the sort of whatever, I'm the most important person on the planet. And secondly, a negation of all horizons of significance, meaning that we're sharing less and less systems of meaning. Like we don't actually share a lot of our meanings uh, because each one of us is pursuing our own authentic self in our own way. And politically what this leads to is first off, the first uh, element leads to disengagement. People more and more so focused on themselves rather than on civic engagement. The second one leads to increasingly uh, fragmentation. And fragmentation, when multiple people believe in multiple different things and have multiple different issues, ultimately leads to a politics of special interest uh, sound bites. Now, where does this take us? So that it would be hopeful that maybe this could change the game a little bit. And certainly we know that this matters for many different reasons, many of the reasons that everybody's already mentioned. So I'm just going to go through this real fast. It's not controlled by the few. It's not one way. It's created by, for, and around networks, not masses. It transforms individual pursuits into collective actions, and it makes group formation ridiculously easy, so much so that it's almost like they're not even groups. They're more like flocks and swarms, whatever metaphor you might want to grab. But I also want to approach this question, and, it's, and I don't have an answer for it, I just have a question. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so analyzing this and basically bringing up more questions, not necessarily answers. But I want to talk about why this might deeply matter. And that it's based on a few philosophical principles. The first one is that we know ourselves through our relations with others. That is, you, you come to know yourself through your conversations with others and so on, and, and what they reflect back to you. New media create new ways of relating to, it, to others, and therefore it follows then that new media would create new ways of knowing ourselves. And therefore, new media might be creating new ways of knowing our authentic self. It might be changing the search for the authentic self. It might be changing the very notion of what it is to be authentic. It might be changing the very notion of what it is to be a self. Those are very deep and big questions that I can't answer in the next 20 minutes, but I'm going to at least show you what we're up to in the exploration of this. So what we do, um, I actually grab a handful of students every semester and we just dive into this little world of you know, Web 2.0 social media stuff. And for the last two and a half years or so, we've taken as our locus of interest uh, YouTube. Now YouTube is itself way too big to study all on its own. I mean, they just released this figure that they say 20 hours of videos uploaded every minute. And if you do the math on this, that's over 1.7 million minutes per day. That's over a thousand times faster than you can watch. It's almost 500,000 videos a day, and that's just on YouTube. And if you recognize that YouTube uh, has about a uh, 
somewhere between a 43 and uh, percent market share, maybe up to 63 percent. It may be as many as mil one million online videos uploaded per day. So it's pretty intense, you know, to think about how you study this phenomenon. But I do want to mention, this is a very important statistic, that over 99.9% .9 is irrelevant to you. Um, I actually, when I looked over my numbers last night, I recognized this is a very low estimate. And I, so, um, but what we do is we actually just jump right in on YouTube. And so before I, I do that, though, I want to just give you a quick tour of YouTube, at least half of it. So the first thing I'll mention is that it's not all young people, right? This is actually 92-year-old Irving Fields singing about YouTube. And if you want to, there's tons of YouTube theme songs if you're interested in finding them. But the most commonly uploaded videos are home videos like this, which almost all of you have seen. And so this is what uh, Andrew is talking about. There's like a new language going on here. And, and with drag and drop editing, people can get really sophisticated with this. So this is like the hip hop version of Charlie Bit My Finger. Charlie Bit Me. But what we became really interested in was that there's over 20,000 videos addressed to the YouTube community every day. So we want to know what is this community? Hey, YouTubers. Hi, everybody. Yo, Swift Cry Job, Monkey Dude 1212 here. Hi, hey, YouTube. This is Powers. So, this became our locus of interest. And so, we wanted to know what YouTube was like as a medium of community. So, got you know, these undergrads together, and we all just started getting on YouTube and engaging in this community. And very quickly, the insights started to come. And here's one of my students uh, having one of the early important insights into this research. I'm, you know, looking at a camera, and I uh, had a mirror right up here to sh show you guys, but, oh, here it is. This is what I'm talking to. Not you, this. Both you, but this. I'm talking to you, but for the time being, I don't know who you are. So this is an important element, just in thinking about how our conversations are mediated and what it means to be mediated. And so we were thinking about not just the webcam, but then you think about, you know, when you're Twittering, you're not looking at, you know, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to this. Or when I'm Facebooking, it's not you, but this. When I'm blogging, it's not you, but this. And that these mediums, these, the, the different mediums through which we communicate, actually shape the message in some way. They shape the conversation. They shape the possibilities for community, for identity construction, and ultimately for self-awareness. And what's really interesting about the camera in itself is that it creates this moment of what we came to call context collapse. Basically, when you are uh, presenting yourself to somebody uh, in face-to-face -face conversation, you are presenting a certain version of yourself. And we all have very, many different versions of ourselves that we bring forth in different contexts. But when you're facing a camera, you're sitting there imagining the possibilities of 1.4 billion people on the planet who might see this. You don't actually know who you're talking to, or when, or in what context. And so it creates this, this version of context collapse, which forces a certain amount of self-awareness and sort of self-consciousness uh, that maybe isn't present in typical everyday conversation. So we've started recognizing this just in our first vlog. So I'll show you a uh, this is how we introduced ourselves on YouTube through a series of, of vlogs. And we started to recognize that people all over YouTube who are doing their first vlogs often encounter this, this sort of uh, context collapse and self-consciousness -conscious and so on. Hey. Hey, I'm Mike Wesch. I'm a professor at Kansas State University. <laughs> Hi. 
<laughs> Hi, my name is Jesse. And I feel like I have to put a picture of a person right here. You know, maybe an eye. It would be so much better if this thing blinked and smiled and responded to what I said. Uh, okay, so I thought I'd do this before my roommate gets back and finds me talking to myself. So I am in my closet. Um, I feel a little strange out in the family room just talking to what seems like myself. So. And I'm a college student. College student. Enunciate. And to tell you the truth, I actually spent about five minutes deciding how I was going to work my hair back or up. All forming this identity in this new mask to my new community. One of the most surprising things we found was that people were not just nervous about other people seeing them and not knowing who might see them and so on, that sort of context collapse, but also this moment of recognizing that you yourself will see you later and that you yourself might be a different person later and look back at yourself and think like, boy, what a dork or that kind of thing, you know? And uh, so that brought up these ideas that were pretty old by this time. Marsha McLuhan was talking about this idea of recognition, uh, you know, almost uh, 30 years ago. 40 years ago, and here's a, a little element of this that we brought in. We live in the world of the instant replay. Around the planet, all the events are not only being recorded, but replayed. And the amazing thing about the replay is that it offers the means of recog, recognition. The first time is cognition, the second time is recognition. And the recognition is even deeper. So replay offers a deeper level of awareness than the, the first play. Well, we had to, you know, been getting into some very large matters about the effects of this new environment, this new electric environment on man and his awareness of himself. I guess that's what makes me so uncomfortable talking on camera. It's just like, I'm right now I'm looking at my face and like, good God. <laughs> Because when I think of myself, I guess I don't really think of myself the way I appear to other people. <laughs> Which is, yeah, young, naive. Oh, she's so cute. A cute little girl. Not cute. <laughs> So you can see that, I mean, you see this all over on YouTube if you start probing around a bit. People get deeply self-reflective on YouTube, and it also turns into a confessional, which I'll get into in just a second. Um, and what's interesting then is on the other end is that there's also this anonymity of watching, that they can't see you watching them while you're watching YouTube. And this has certain effects. And one of the obvious effects, I think, was pointed out most brilliantly by Lev Grossman. And when he looked at the comments, he said, some of the comments on YouTube make you weep for the future of humanity, just for the spelling alone. <laughs> Never mind the obscenity and the naked hatred. And this is the first example I came to. Um, this is from one of the Charlie Bit My Fingers uh, finger remakes. And you can see the type of dialogue that you get on here. This is one of my favorites here is this last bit. Freckly Girl 14 says, YouTube comments make me angry. Grr. And QWERTYU121 responds, and don't comment on YouTube, you shit stain. So the obvious analysis here that many people have made is that anonymity plus physical distance plus a rare and ephemeral dialogue creates hatred as a public performance. But there is another element here. These same three conditions also create the conditions for the freedom to experience humanity without fear or anxiety, without any sense of social anxiety, as you'll see here by one, uh, vlogger uh, expressing it, I think, brilliantly here. Slightly voyeuristic, you know? And, um, it allows you to watch other people without staring at them or making them uncomfortable because they don't see you watching them. You can just watch their videos. And it's really interesting. It's like this sociological experiment where you can just like see their being. You can see their person. 
And so I want to add a little context to this. In the context of our culture in which we express so strongly individualism, independence, and commercialization, we still strongly value community relationships and authenticity, maybe the more so for the more that we express these things. And this becomes a tension, and at the center of this tension are all of us as individuals really wanting connection. Like we really seek this connection. But as individuals, we see this connection as constraint. And what YouTube and other social media can offer is a way of mitigating that, can create a, situ a situation of connection without constraint. What you'll see on YouTube is tremendously deep communities. And what I mean by deep is that people are connecting by revealing parts of themselves that they refuse to reveal even to their family or to their closest friends. They're revealing parts of themselves they would not reveal otherwise. It's just amazing to me how powerful this this medium is. I mean, I'm just I'm sitting I'm sitting in my living room, you know, talking to a camera. My God, the interaction, it, it's unbelievable. Well, this will get you in the mood so that you're like, oh, this is how it's done. It's casual. We just talk to the camera here. Put that up there, see if that helps. I gotta figure this thing out eventually. Just uh, came by to say, uh, came by, what do you mean came by? I didn't come by, I'm sitting right here. And January is a hard month for me. Right now, I should be preparing for my, the birth of my son, but I'm not. As you guys already know. Hi, Mel. I watched your video, and uh, sorry I'm running behind on my schedule here. I was listening to it, and I felt my tears coming. It's a big fucking experiment in putting myself out. We're all learning from each other and about ourselves. And that's what I think fucking YouTube should be about. Thank you, guys. So in the midst of this, a hero emerges. And I think this is one of the great early heroes of YouTube. Um, I think it's indicative. This is actually five years ago today, this guy who goes by the name One Man, this sort of anonymous hero, steps out looking for a hug. You know, he's one of these millions of people who feels too anonymous, too insignificant, and too disconnected. And is just looking for somebody to hug. So he goes out into the mall and starts to find people willing to connect with him. And this is such a, it becomes such a powerful message, it starts to spread. Other people take up the signs. And it's just like this moving thing because it's, it's all these anonymous strangers connecting. And it, it gets a lot of play on YouTube, over 45 million hits. And then it goes global from there. And there's over 20,000 videos on YouTube related to this. And they're from all over the world. But of course, um, it wouldn't be YouTube without the sort of snarky little spoof. So uh, here comes the snarky little spoofster offering. <laughs> These are really, really good. And they're not as smelly as the hippie hugs. So I got one more hero for you guys, and this is another anonymous hero. He, he, goes, he goes by the name Mad V. Uh, he wears a Guy Fox mask. And what he does is he tries to use his anonymity to basically become a platform for collaboration. And he creates a way in which thousands of YouTubers can actually collaborate on a single video. And in this one, he simply invites them to make a stand, to make a statement, by writing something on their hand and holding it up to their webcam. And it's pretty interesting to think about what people would hold up to their webcam. And ultimately, thousands of people do this. It becomes the most responded to video on YouTube at the time. And here they are in the most, what seems like a very private space, but it's actually the most public space on the planet, holding up these messages, and this is what they say. So they send messages of loving yourself, uh, loving others. They do it in a way that it's clear they speak a new form of language. They all speak video. They do it beautifully and artistically. And they start trying to 
use the platform to break down boundaries. Sending out messages of unity and connection. But I think it's important to note in light of Dana's talk yesterday that these are not statements of fact and it would be tragic optimism to view these as statements of fact. They wouldn't state these things if they felt like they already existed. Instead, these are not statements of fact, but these are ultimately calls to action. So, the obvious question then to this room is what it all means in terms of this and ultimately how can we, uh, th the thousand of us or so in this room, how can we use this to conquer the narcissistic disengagement we see today in a culture that's sort of still ruled by trivialities? Um, so, and I, I want to channel Neil Postman again on this to, to close out my talk today. Neil Postman in, in 1984, what he was looking at, looking back to the 1800s, he looked at the debate between Lincoln and Douglas. Throughout the 1850s, Lincoln and Douglas were having these debates. And these debates were fundamentally different than the political dates, debates we see today. And the reason why is because each candidate had at least an hour to talk. And then the other candidate would have at least an hour to respond and so on. And they would lay out very long and rational arguments that Postman argues only somebody who is a you know, a person of the book could really understand. Somebody sort of grounded in the logic of print could truly understand. So in comes, you know, he was comparing this to the debates of the day. In 1984, the debates of the day where each candidate would have about 30 seconds to respond and, and it, they ran more like uh, political commercials, right? And so enter YouTube and there's a number of awesome possibilities when you enter uh, video into this uh, politics. But what happened with the YouTube debates was basically more of the same, right? I mean, you, you got these really entertaining questions from people like Billiam the Snowman, and while the questions were entertaining, they were still the same basic questions. And then ultimately, the worst part of it was that each candidate still only had 30 seconds to a minute to respond. Disagreements were mentioned, but never debated, so it really wasn't a real debate. In the end, uh, you, I think Postman would say that we were still kind of amusing ourselves to death, uh, but we're in a sea of amusements and in which this trying to compete with other amusements was still only viewed by less than 1% of Americans. So in this regard, I think Postman would be disappointed in where we're at today. But I think if he could be in this room today, I think what he would see is that we're not interested in creating the same old conversation. I think the YouTube debates basically f were flawed in allowing TV to dictate that conversation. And what we can do with a new environment is create new types of conversations and basically create a whole new groundwork for the way these conversations work. And I'll leave you with this idea that maybe by doing this we can work towards a new future of whatever. And we'll move from the 60s of the I don't care whatever you think and from away from the 90s whatever I don't care what you think and we'll end up with a future in which we can say I care. Let's do whatever it takes by whatever means necessary. Thanks.